Anybody tell me where I am? Somewhere in the Bible. Yeah. All right. This is a good place to be. Somewhere in Benin. It was a dark and sunny night. Okay. So what did we what did we discuss last week? The unclean food and the tithing. Right, yeah. We spoke about tithing, we spoke about un, the unclean and, and clean. Uh, mentioned one or two New Testament references. Um, I'm going to ask just in case someone got confused. Is everybody on that okay with what we discussed last week? Yes? Alright, happy to see Well, this is a short session. All right, I want you to do Deuteronomy 15. Deuteronomy 15. Okay. okay, so Deuteronomy 15 verse 1. At the end of every seven years, you are to have a Shemitah. Okay, what is Shemitah? What is your translation saying? Release of Release of Release of Release of Okay, you will hear this. Okay, and it's basically what they call the sabbatical year. Alright? Which you will you will hear a lot about this. There was a lot of a lot of guys um, having discussions about the Shemitah, and it's a very important time, and we're going to find out why. Here, that here is how the Shemitah is to be done. Every creditor is to give up what he is loaned to his fellow member of the community. He is not to force his neighbor or relative to copy or to sorry his neighbor or relative to repay it because its otherwise time of remission has been proclaimed. You may demand of the foreigner to repay his debt, but you are to release your claim on whatever you, your brother owes you. Alright? So here he's already starting up and he's sitting alright. Here we have this every seventh year cycle. Alright? So once every seven years, he says, you have got to release. What else do we know about the semantical cycle? So, isn't it um, also the agriculture? Right. The land race. Okay. First, yeah. Well, that excludes usually. We don't like to charge it. Well, look. If, if, you, if you look at charging interest and things like that anyway, you, you as as a believer to another believer, you generally not under the scripture as a reference. So it's only like this, you borrow something, you've got to repay it, okay? So what he's saying is, now you get people that are among you that are needy and they need to borrow money from you, okay? He says, every seventh year you are to make a remission, okay? And it says you are not to, you're not allowed, you're not allowed to demand, okay, from your person. This demand kicks back. Where else do we hear about this demand word? Think back, think before Pesach. In the Bible. Economics is a good place to start. Alright? This word, this Hebrew word, goes back to when the taskmasters were. These masters would be over the Jewish people and they would say, I would demand of you a certain amount of bricks. Say work. Okay, so what he's saying is now, yeah, has come a point where he says, you cannot act like the Egyptians. You are not allowed to go in and demand from them. I want you guys to understand a little principle here. When we start to focus on our relationships together, right? God brings a family together and he says, all right, now this is family. And we've got a whole bunch of brothers and sisters out there. They come to you, you know their situation, you know their need. He talks about giving openly. He talks about being there for them. He talks about loving them. He talks about helping if you possibly can. Alright? He 
It says every seven years now, you're just going to stop and take stock. Why the number seven? Completion. 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 God's plan. God's purpose. And His purpose is to set you free. And if you have that power in yourself to set someone free, just like you were set free from Egypt, do it. The thing is, we can quite easily get hung up on the money. We can get hung up, yeah, but I gave you, yeah, but you let, yeah, yeah, it's just like the last time. Baruch Hashem, you're not in that situation. And remember, whatever God has given you, because we're talking about this is what you, you are in the land. You are going to act holy. You are going to be set apart. You are not going to be common or, or unclean. You're going to act differently. You know, New Testament says it this way. How will, how will you know that you are Yeshua's disciples? Love one another. What does that mean? How do you love one another? Alright, let's try that one person. Lay down love for another. Lay down. There's no greater love than someone who lays down their life for another. What else? As I have loved you. What is that? Treat them the way you act towards them. The way you show love. Because yes. I can say it with my mouth, yes, I love you, but it's what my actions do that determines the level of love. <coughs> yeah, we get stuck on, you know, we get these people, okay? And, okay, you get churchy face people. <laughs> you come here, you smile, you sit here, and you go, oh, it's lovely to see you. God, it's lovely to meet you, boy. And then there's nothing. No, no linking together, nothing in between the rest of the week. There is just no, there's nothing else. Okay, and we come into this situation and God, you know, I, I find it very interesting that He tries, that He starts to bring people together and He starts to link you in ways that make people normally feel quite uncomfortable. And I smile. But you get to know people on their level, not just on the once a week level. If we're called to be a community, we're called to be a family, how well must I know you to be able to say, Dave, I'm having a really, really tough time. I need to borrow some money. I need to be pretty comfortable with Dave to be able to go to my brother and say, hey, I need your help. But don't, don't, don't worry. Everything's fine. You can sit in your own little corner and don't ask for help. <coughs> Why would there be a remission of loans every seven years if that's what you were supposed to do? You know, one of the hardest things we learn is humility. And one of the biggest tools he teaches us is it's quite easily to make you humble when you go through a time of, maybe you had a time of illness or um, a, a, a time when you had to ask advice. But people get most ashamed when you have to look at someone in the eyes and say, um, I, I really need some money. I really need some food. What is God teaching Israel? Remember when you were in Egypt? You've all had those months, okay? You've been a grown up for a while, you've had those months where money's been a little tight. You know? In my own experience, I come by this house, drive in the IS, life is, uh, life is grand, and then the interest rates started going up. Yeah, and it wasn't just a little bit, I think it was about 5% in total in six months. And my bond repayment was comfortable to, if this gets up any higher, I'm going to go back and eat mom's house. <laughs> no, you just moved down to mom's house. You're a grown man. You need to stand on your own two feet, right? And God in His mercy stopped it just before it got to that level. And then the creepy broke. Then the pool liner came out. <laughs> then we found out that it was pitch five <coughs> all over the place and that was a small fortune to replace which had to be replaced you're a grown man stand on your own two feet mommy can i please i need some help 
I had to go back and I had to humble myself and I had to go and say, you know what, I can't do this. I need help. I need, I need help to get, to get over this and fix these things. And it's every grown man's dream to run back to mommy and just say, please. <laughs> it was just, just to that point when it was like God saying, ah, you're a big boy. Bah! Sit down, keep right for a little bit. Like, okay. Joseph had a couple of those moments, yes? Look at my fancy cloak. I'm obviously the favorite. Go and do what I want. Before he realized that cloak was torn to shreds and it was like, yeah, I hate that cloak. And every time he got a new cloak, got ripped away from me. Sure. Why? Pride. Yeah. Because you start to get a little bit of a head of yourself and you're like, I am in charge of my master's entire house. The only thing I'm not allowed to do is go near you. And remember the story? Mm -hmm. He ran and all she had left was his cloak. His authority. He's a symbol of authority. That which gave him pride, that helped him to think that he was lifted up. And if God wants to lift you up, you need to realize where you came from. And we forget that. It could be so easy. Think about it. Three, four hundred years in, the Exodus is an old story. You've got vast tracts of farmland. You are doing Baruch Hashem, your storehouses are overflowing, you're in a good place. And you're standing there and, and all things, and then people come up to you, not so fortunate. Maybe they're having a Joseph moment where they were there, and because of their arrogance, because of their pride, God had to bring them down a notch. And teaching them humility, they would have to come up to another and say, can I glean from your fields? Can can I? I just I just need to be able to pay. And we're like, oh, you know, there's people who don't know how to deal with their finances. All right, but how are you going to repay? How are you going to make good on your payment? No, no, you can do it month for month or, or whatever the case may be. Fine. Just as long as I get my money back, okay? You've got to teach them the responsibility, right? I'm not saying there's anything wrong with getting your payment of notes. Your intention and how you do it, and maybe your heart needs to be adjusted. God's busy teaching them humility. He's also teaching you that you have been elevated for this purpose. If you are sitting with a lovely sum of money, do me a favor. Go home and ask God, what's this for? Because I promise you, it's not just for your comfort. He could be building you up to prepare so that you can survive a famine. He could be showing you something about His love, and but also at the same time, as your cup overfloweth. There could be so many aspects of teaching and love that He's trying to get you to understand. And we get to this place where someone has to come into you and then they go, all right, but then God says, you know what? I don't care how big the load is. When the seventh year comes, and if he asks you on the third year, don't increase the installment payments that he can pay. It. This is not your 20-year plan. How many of you would like a bond that extinguishes after six years? <laughs> Man, I would like this story. Eh? So yes, please, I will make those payments for a 20-year cycle. Did I tell you I'm Jewish? <laughs> After six years, it's gone. Sorry, it's against my religion. You can't make me pay. God said. It says, After six years, you will, no matter what, if you have every good intention, but God forbid, something happens and you miss one or two payments. Do not act like those Egyptians did. Remember where you come from. What I've placed in your hand is a blessing for you to share. And yes, you're going to give gift offerings, you're going to give your tithes, and you're going to worship God, and you, you're going to take care of the widow and the orphan, but don't think for a second that that means neglect your brother who comes to you. You know, I read a scripture that said, you know, I had some scriptural teaching that spoke about 
doing good for those around you while you can. Maybe you have that extra 50 bucks or that extra 100 bucks or that extra plate of food, those leftovers, whatever it is. That extra room. Maybe you have that because God has prepared it for the person who needs it. And he wants you to remember. Remember where I found you. Remember where I picked you up and I dusted you off while you were crying in your soup about Oh, what was me? My life is so terrible. Whatever Mitzrayim, whatever bondage you were in. Remember when you cried out to me and I found you and I picked you up and I dusted you off and I said, All right, come now, I'm going to make you something more. I'm going to teach you about me. I'm not going to give you just that. I'm going to give you me. And if he decided to just lift you up a little bit more, don't look at other people differently because they're the people that have just cried out to God's scenario or need to be humble, or need that love and compassion. And where am I, if I cannot get compassion from my family, where am I going to get it? We are so quick, sorry, we are so quick to judge the situation before understanding the situation. And once we understand them and we come into them and we come into that situation and we go, wow, how many of you can listen to other people's stories and appreciate that you're not the one going through it? <laughs> what are you going to do about it? Um, it is actually a law, uh, if you read just further on verses 7 and 8, uh, that you are not to refuse the poor and you are to lend all that it is. And I'm going forward, but I'm just asking now a question based on it. Um, uh, a lot of times there are people that will call you and they want money and they want you to borrow money but they have no intention of ever paying you back. Um, is there no kind of a reconciliation between the two of you or are you just expect to, you're, by definition, you're not borrow, lending money, you're now, are you now giving it away? Or what is the, how do you reconcile this? I think you have to have the sermon. Obviously, if you make a loan, if you are in that situation, you have to honor the fact that you have to repay it back. It's like me coming to buy something from you and saying, no, no, you're a believer, you have to forgive me, but I'm not paying you. Look at my new fancy car. Yeah. Okay, that is just as unbelievable. So, how do, uh, so do I then say, listen, you haven't paid me back or whatnot. So the next time, he, if he comes and again, I say, no, I'm not going to, but then am I transgressing the law? I think you definitely have to, you have to pray about this situation, you have to pray about the law, and you have to ask about whether this is going to help them or deter them, okay? This is the thing. The people coming to you, they might say, oh, okay, this is the situation, I'm just going to go. My personal feeling is if I have that extra bit of money and they come in and they do it, I give them, if I get money back, I get money back, but I don't expect it. Right. No, the, I also think um, when you read in here, you see it says when the people have enough, you can borrow them and they are required to pay it back. But if you're looking at someone that doesn't have food on their plate, don't withhold your money so they can, you know, for food. If they say I need to borrow money to buy a car, you know, a new car, and they have got a job and they can, yeah. then that's fine. But I think, yeah, that's what you need to discern. What is yeah. the situation? Yeah. No, look, I mean, some people have, have, have gone past uh, the humbling experience and then they just go straight into, you owe me. Mm -hmm. This is not the right one. Mm -hmm. We need to make sure that when you come in, remember, you have a responsibility. You are a steward of God's funds. Mm -hmm. It's nice to think that you earned that money and you've got everything and, 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 and we're grown-ups now. You're going to get their youth, I promise. But... Realize God gave you the strength. He woke you up that morning so that you can get out of bed so you can go and get that money. It's a two-way street. You could not do anything unless He gave you that strength. I also think that it's a bit deeper than just finance because that person's in your path because God's trusting you with them. Mm -hmm. And then there's a relationship that you need to bond with that person because maybe sometimes, I know I'm like this, sometimes you just need someone in your corner rooting for you, encouraging you so that you know that, okay, I can get through this. So I think it's more of like being a friend 
spend the money. That's both. But you like obviously have the discernment whether you have to be giving money or food or 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 life and just walk with that person. You see, that's the thing. It's so it's so distorted because it would have to normally take a lot for another brother of Israel to come across and go to that person knowing that I can. I can ask. I don't want to, but I can. And there is that relationship where you go, wow, what happened? What's going on in your life? That this is now so, so rough. So explain this to me. And then we can stop and we can go, Abba, what do you want from me? Okay, all right. Uh, this day and age, we've got, we've got two different types of people that I find, and I'm generalizing here quite a bit, obviously. We have the, I have money and I don't want to deal with you people. People throw money at them and say, go away. Okay. Don't want to have to deal with your issues, I'll give you 20 bucks, let me know. Yes, I don't know. Okay? And then we go, you know, we don't want to get involved with that scenario. That's, that's not right. And then we get other people that go, well, I have all this money. You're not going to get my money. I'll work for this money, but I'll give you advice. Advice is not going to make you full. You know, if you invest in Investec, because there's going to be a fantastic third quarter, but I'm asking you for bread. Oh, well, then you're going to have to get a job. You have a job for me? No, no, no. Me, I've got my own job. You have to go get your own job. How do I tell my brother, you know, God loves him if I don't meet his needs? If I'm not there for him when they're down? And I promise you, God forbid you ever have to get into that situation where you have to rely on other people. It's not a comfortable place to be. And if you're going through that situation, smile, look up, and say, Abba, I'm listening. At one time or another, we will, he's teaching you something. He wants to build you. He doesn't want to break you. And that's the thing. We need to get over ourselves and realize that everything that God is giving us is to build us up. Okay? Let me carry on. Um, so you're not to force anybody or relative to repay it because Adonai's time of remission has been proclaimed. If you are out of that time and he is, uh, if he is able to repay you, he should repay you. you you may demand it of the foreigner to repay his debt, but you are to release your claim on whatever your brother owes you. Okay, now we notice we're getting a whole bunch of foreigners or what, what, what uh, the Jews like to call the Goyim, the nations. Okay, there is a, there's an interesting principle here. It seems like God just draws us, you know, this line in the sand and he goes, Poof. This is, this is my, my precious sister, and I love them, and you people can eat their carcasses and all types of things, and God doesn't really care. You cannot have God without that covenant relationship. You can't, let me say it this way, you can't expect the blessings of having God and live out of covenant. Okay? How are you going to provoke people to jealousy or show them love or show them how to reach out if... They don't see, again, Yeshua, how will they know you are my disciples, how you love one another? And then they're going to come to you and then they're going to go, okay, you guys are weird, what's going on? What, 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 what is it about you that I'm seeing here that I don't see anywhere else? Then you can open up and you can tell them about your God and what God has done for you and where you are. And then they go, wow. So you say, if I give my life to God, I come into His family, I come and I get treated as one of His own. Yes. And there's a whole bunch of different way, there's a whole different way of thinking when you do. You know when you're my guy, when you convert into Judaism, even today, I could owe Kev, he's a good Jewish man, I owe him four million rand. And I'm a Gentile. And if I'm a guy, I convert, he writes that debt off. See, in their mind, a proselyte is now someone who has now become alive when he was dead. And he's not allowed to be grumpy. Because the son has come back into the kingdom. 
He is a new creation. When you Magai, you become Jewish, you convert, you choose a new name. Everything changes about you. That's what a proselyte is. Even all the way back into Yeshua's time. You understand the whole thing about going into the water to mikvah. Water was a symbol of chaos because when God was there hovering over everything, everything was void and formless. He had to bring order out of the chaos. A dove hovering over the waters. The Ruach HaKodesh. It's the same image when he was baptized, when he was mikvah. And he brought order out of it. Physical order from physical chaos. And then he brought spiritual order in a world that has completely forgotten who he was. And you get to come into that. But how are you going to want anything of that if you don't see how it operates first? You can't have the blessing and live like the world. It doesn't work that way. Said, so we as a nation, as God's people, God has dictated that we have a Shemitah. Do you have that God? Do you have that Shemitah? No, we don't. So you want the blessing, but you don't want to stay in covenant. That's not how God operates. God loves you. He wants you home. He wants you to have the Shemitah. He wants you to have brothers that will look after you like this. He wants you to understand who you are. But please don't go play over there and expect all the blessings from here. Prosperity theology is a very dangerous game when it's all about you and all about your comfort and all about your wealth, but you have zero responsibility to God. He loves you, right? So He's going to give you. So you just have to praise Him and call those blessings down from heaven and everything will just flow into you and you can praise God because of. But you live like the world. You just want it to be financed. That's all you're doing. You want to be bankrupt. Where is your responsibility? Where is the relationship? Where is the covenant? Remember, Exodus 19. If you listen to my words and keep my covenant, then you become a peculiar treasure. Then you become my people. Then you become Kadosh Le Adonai. Then. Every relationship has a then. If you want to have the benefits of a husband. Well, you've got to become one first. How do I know you're going to stick around? How do I know that that's your heart? How do I know that's what you're going to bring into this relationship? Oh, you want all the nice, warm, fuzzy stuff, but when, when times get tough, you leave because you have never even made that stand. You've never said, here I am, making a declaration that this is who I am and this is who I belong to. Why do you think baptism is surrounded with witnesses? Because I remember what you said on that day. I remember what you decreed. I remember who you belong to. And if you act contrary to that, it is our job to be able to hold you to account. Because what happens when you are out of covenant? You didn't have God. You didn't have those blessings. You didn't have that relationship. Don't think that we can hijack the blessings and stay on the outside. You can't have one foot in and one foot out. Act like God wants you to act. Love each other. Walk with each other. Build each other up. Correct each other. Hold each other back from doing stupid things. And if you can't love them enough to up their sin because you know what? If you hide your sin, what happens? They get away with it. And that's only going to breed more sin because it doesn't stop. We don't like consequence to sin. We want freedom from consequence. Remember where you came from. If you want to meet Skrayim, it's just down the road. Don't tell me you love me and you stay in my land, you get my reign, you get all the blessings that I provide because you are in a covenant relationship with me. And then you run off and you say, well, you know, I've only come here for, the, for, for you know, harvest time, but I'm really living an Egyptian life. 
Is that making sense? Yeah. Okay. okay. Yes. Uh, <coughs> thinking about that, um, something that really struck me this week. If I don't have a passionate love for one that I'm, that I'm serving, mm -hmm. I don't have that love for him. I don't have a love that, that, that is, you know, even if I go through a hard time. Um, but I'm, I'm really, my focus is completely on him. We were at a funeral on Wednesday. And um, the, the husband that, uh, of his wife passed away, but he stood up and he said, he just wants to send a song to you know, and he started to sing, turn your eyes upon Jesus. And it, it, it really it hit home for me because many times we lose our focus. If our focus is on Christ, we become like Him. If our focus is not on Christ, we become like the world. That's a very simple point. If I'm going to be looking upon Christ and I see my brother suffering, I will then see to their need. But if I'm looking upon the world and I see my brother suffering, me trying to supply that need would not be it won't be um, it's, it's, priority in my heart. Yes. Um, so it's, it's it, I think it comes down to, to, to that love for Christ. If I love him, then I will keep his commandments. If I love him, then I will want to do his will. If I love him, I'll be passionate about him. Um, but if I'm not, then It's a reality check. Every now and again we need that reality check. It's not about us, it's about God. It's about the God we're reflecting. The God we're, we're, we have the blessing to be able to stand up and say, this is, this is why we are where we are. Mm. We might not have arrived at where we want to be. Well, Hashem, He's still busy, yes? Mm. But He's getting us to where we want to be. Where He needs us to be. To be able to get us there. But we have to yield to that process at least. How many times did Joseph have to learn about humility before he was being able to be elevated? How many times do we have to learn before we are elevated? I just want to add to what he said, because this is something that is really, the Father is really working on that right now, because it's amazing. What he's just spoken now is exactly a message I received two days ago, and it's exactly what the Father is busy working on at the moment. There are many people that are walking the Torah path and they are obeying His commands and doing all these outer things, but at the end of the day, they're not allowing the Father to be able to do the inner work that needs to be done within their hearts. So we do these outer manifestations and we think that we, you know, we're so good because we've done all of this, but really it is a work that is a work within the heart. And what I have come to understand and what the Father is really revealing in this hour is the more time you spend with Him, the more you allow Him to do the deeper work in you, the more you start to see who He is, the more you start to see who He is, the more you reverence Him, the more you fear Him, and the more you become like Him. So it's really a case of where we're trying to achieve it by saying, okay, I'm, I'm doing these things because I'm trying to please you. And He's saying, no, 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 draw near to me, draw near to me. Come back to me. Sit with me. Let me teach you who I am. And the more he teaches you who he is, the more you start to obey out of the love and the reverence that you have for him, as opposed to you doing it as an outer thing of yourself. So that's why he says he is the one who he writes the Torah on your heart. It's something that he writes on your heart. It's something that he does that He causes you to want to obey because you come to know who He is, you come to love Him, you come to, to respect Him, you come to know Him in such a way that you don't do it out of that you have to, but you actually do it because you want to, because you reverence Him, you reverence him in such a way. Mm. You, you know what that is, yes, Auntie? <laughs> I can understand what I mean today because um, there's something that I really like it was something that came to my mind um, this morning as you started speaking and it was just a bit that Yoshua said learn from me and then he also said what we must learn but, but the fact that he said learn from me so that, that ties in with what the father said to, to be with him and, and in that way we will learn from him 
<laughs> and with all these things we spoke about, um, how we should love and all that, you can learn it all from him. You know, you know, if we look at it, you know there's a New Testament picture of this. We were chatting was one of the things I explained, youth. Can you remember? If you have all the outer array but nothing is there, which or what which story did we talk about in the bonfire? Oh. But I convince you spoke a lot, man. Come on. <laughs> Remember the cursing of the fig tree? Yes. Okay. Yeshua teaching his disciples just before he goes off. He says, you need to understand something about that fig tree. When you go to Israel, the leaf and the fig start to develop at the same time. So if you go there and you see a fig tree full of leaves, you know there has to be fruit. But when he went and he looked... He saw all the outward array, all the foliage of promise. But when he looked deeper in, there was nothing there. And he cursed it. And they marveled at how their trees showed up. And people get stuck on, why was he angry at trees? <laughs> Remember, you're dealing with people that are on the outside doing everything that they should. So you wear sit sit, you say things like Chak Sameach, you say you, you keep that Shabbat. But what makes you different from an atheist Jew who celebrates Passover? Okay. That's right. I'm just thinking of that scripture. What is it? We um, basically, without love, we are a noise. <laughs> what is that scripture? Yes. Yeah. Without love, you're nothing but what's it? Sunny brass and things. And it's so easy to do the motions, though. You can. You can. You can really. I mean, I've been there so many times. You can look the part, and you can be at the. The services, but you know, when you walk away, it's. Yeah, it also brings up the one with um, a, a man that gets it. It's like a man who looks in the mirror. Right. Yeah. Can I add something? Just what Mark was saying, and then tell you, uh, I had the exact same thing this week sitting at home mom and talking. We've got this idea in life that there's three voices there's God's voice, there's my voice, and there's us, but there's not. There's only two. There's God and has the time. Don't fool yourself to be thinking that you do in your life because you think that's what you must do. If it's not, uh, if it's not, if you're not listening to what God is saying, it's has the time. You can't serve two masters. Either the one, or the other. And the thing is, if you're focusing more on God, that's who you're going to become like. If you're focusing on what you want, it's not what you want. It's has the time. It's the world. Sure. There's only two. It's so one way or the other. Yeah. Sure. That's why it's called the delusion. <laughs> <laughs> Guys, when God comes, He's going to look for your fruit. Um, you know, when I was talking to Rebecca, and you know, she 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 wanted to do um, another fundraising thing, and then um, they, they wanted to give out a sit sit on Mother's Day. And I just I stopped and I said, you know, I just just s s let's slow down a little bit. Slow down a little bit. As much as we want to give people God in our passion and our desire and and, and, and everything that, that 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 comes with it, if you don't understand what this means and what it represents, you make the holy common. And God forbid one day there's going to be a lovely Jewish man who's going to walk around and people have got sit sit on their bags and sit sit on their on their arms and sit sit on on, on their clothes or sit sit bookmarks or whatever. And they look at this person and they go, "That's a covenant relationship. That's this is what they do." And then they're sitting there and they're eating ham sandwiches and having a grand old time. And then they look at you and then they go. You're saying on the outside, you're keeping covered, but on the inside, there's nothing, there's nothing going on. I need to be told first. You, 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 you know what, I had, I, had, I had this great desire, you know, Abba, I need the lotto. 
Why? Because I'm just going to pick everybody up, I'm going to put them on an airplane, we're going to fly LL first class, and we're going to hit Israel, and everybody's going to be reformed, I mean, and we're going to be there. Me. <laughs> you haven't let me finish. God showed me something different. He said, not everybody is ready for Are this. Are they ready? Are they ready? I would take them, I would drop them off, and we would give them God on a platter, and God would just flow, and it would be like every time we've ever been, and then they'll go, you know, I really like the hummus. <laughs> <laughs> and hang on a second. We've been here for three weeks, guys. You know, my next move is buying a kibbutz. What do you mean you like the hummus? <laughs> Which is nice, but you know, what, do you remember what we learned? Mm -hmm. And when people are stepping up into their faith, remember, you want to give them the covenant. You want to give them the relationship. That's what you need to reflect. This is worth it because my God is. And what is the fruit, or what should be the fruit, or the outward foliage is the change in the heart and the leaves that grow. So then when he comes to your tree and he looks inside, he sees the fruits of the Spirit and he sees the outer cloak. And he goes, now this is a tree that has good fruit. We need to be able to discern. Don't get stuck in the motions of just doing things. Yeah, okay, it's the Shemitah. Eh, give you your money because that's what God requires. And you don't love your brother. What good is your money if you don't love him? What good is it you're sitting here if you don't change? What good is it to say you're a disciple and you don't listen to your rabbi? You cry out for me, Lord, Lord, did we not? No, you did whatever you wanted to do, but you did nothing that I wanted you to do. Where is that relationship? Where is that love? Where is that desire to please him? And then again, you know, like this building on what Regan says, you have a choice. You can listen to God or you can listen to the world. And if you think you're not going to make a choice, that means you default to the world. That's who you choose. And then we want God on speed dial when things don't work out. I just want to mention on the sick sick thing, it also works the other way around. Because when you think people shouldn't be wearing it, and then God's like, no, they should be wearing it. I had that, um, when I was teaching the little kiddies, that there's a story about David who, when Saul fell in a deep sleep with mm -hmm. his army, God put them under a deep sleep, and then he came in and then the people he was with said, you can take the kingdom now, you can end Saul now, because God has anointed you as next king. And then he said, no, I will not, because God said, he will give me the kingdom, I won't take it. Yeah. And then he cut the corner of his clo clothing, yeah. which was his deep sleep, you're um, mixing two stories, but yes. Okay. Um, but then he showed him from afar, I could have taken you, but I love you. Because I want to make right with you. And I want you to make right with God. But here, he has a tzitzit because he wasn't following God's Torah. It was an outward thing, but he wasn't keeping God's word. It was also the seal. What was the seal? The king would keep his seal on that side. It was when he went into oh. the cave to relieve himself, that it snuck up behind him and he took the corner of his God. When he was sleeping there, he put a spear and a dagger next to his head, saying, okay. I could have killed you, but I've given you life. Oh, okay. But that thing is very much. You were put into that place because God has chosen you, He has anointed you, now act like it. Yeah. And that's the thing. He was reminding him about what he's supposed to be doing. The seal of the king and the seal from the king. Who are you? And it's a powerful point what you brought up. Yeah. You're standing here, you know, we're going to ask the questions, you know, we listen to about all these mitzvot and we go, oh yes, there's a Shemitah cycle and now I have to worry about loans and not loans and all the rest of it. It all points to one beautiful truth. You belong to me, you are called by my name, you are my children, act like it. What does that mean, Lord? Well, let me give you a manual and explain exactly what that means. I want you to be involved in each other's lives so that you can show love. This is not in a room of acquaintances. This is a place of family. This is not a place where you come and you get a pep talk and then you go and do whatever you want out there. What we do here is very difficult because it requires change. I teach you what God has shown me. I give you what He has said. I say, God has done this. You've read it with me. Now what are you going to do with it? Become a disciple? 
or you're going to hang back. God did not call you to become a believer. He called you to be a Tommy Dick. I'm asking you what you're doing. And the biggest thing, it starts every time. As these guys have echoed. It starts with your heart. It starts with your love for your king. He saved you. As far back as that might be. For some of us, it's not that far ago. That we chose to be baptized. We chose to stand in front of him. Maybe you... Maybe some of you haven't made that choice yet. Me, I would suggest you start thinking about it. If you haven't made that public declaration of saying, Abba, I want all of you, but I'm going to give you all of me. You know what you're telling him? Your life's not worth it. While he was dying on a tree, you're telling him his life wasn't worth it. He died for you anyway. And he's standing there with open arms looking at you saying, come on. But I want a relationship. I want a build, a life. I want you to stand with me and walk with me. And I want to show you who I am. I want to show you what it means to love. I want to show you, I want to show you a love that you've never, ever experienced. Don't get so hung up on your past. Don't get so hung up on where you should be or where you think you should be or what your life purpose is. It's not your life anymore. And I promise you, God has called you to something so much more. If I had, let's put it to you in a way you'll understand. So the, the, some lost kingdom of, of somewhere in no man's land, but let's equate it to the UK. They come up here, the queen comes up these steps, there's a massive procession, they pull in here, they go in, the guards have all cleared out the thing, and they come up and they walk up to you. And in the king or the queen's hand, they have your birth certificate. We're looking for you. But that's, that's me. Right? You might want to sit down. What do you know about your past? What do you know about your father? Do you know where he comes from? Do you know who he is? But I was told he was, you know, I, I, I'm from Ireland or, or Botswana or wherever they told you you're from. And he goes, no. If you look further back, you belong to this hustle. What does that mean? <coughs> you belong with the king. And we have a place prepared for you. What, what, did, what did they call you before? Mr. Kevin? No. You will now be called Prince. Nah, come on. <laughs> uh, 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 by, by the way, this, let me introduce you to your right hand man. Just tell him what you want and it will be taken care of. If you've got any questions, talk to him. And it's not your responsibility to worry about all the other stuff. You're going to get taught and you're going to lead it, but I want you to learn more about your father. And you go trying to pinch yourself and you go and you get transported first class all the way back to your kingdom that you never knew about. And they throw a massive celebration for seven days. The prince has come home. The princess has arrived. The kingdom is getting complete. And you <coughs> come in there and your right hand man, this Yeshua who brought you in, this Ruach HaKodesh is busy teaching you, molding you, pointing you to your father. So that you understand him, understand his past, understand where he came from, understand what he did. Understand what he had to do to find you. And he can't stop smiling and you don't know why. Because this, this old man is looking at you and all he can do is all you see is teeth. And he's like, after all these years, after all these years you're home. Come 
come and receive your inheritance. Come and sit down where you were supposed to be the entire time. I've missed you. And the more time you spend with your father, the more time you're being taught, the more you learn about him and what he did, and you start to respect him, you start to love him, you start to grow in that kingdom, and you start to learn what it means to act like you're a prince or a princess. And you slowly get built up to the place where God willing one day, the kingdom of heaven is yours. You receive that inheritance in you. You are sealed with my forehead. You will sit at the feet of the king. How many of you would hesitate coming into that limbo? Mm. 